All right, well, uh, welcome back. And thanks again to Menzi Chin, Mary Lovely, Phil Lively, and uh, Ian Coxhead for a really insightful first session on the backlash or multiple backlashes or possibly not backlashes against trade and, and globalization. This is a really great discussion. Uh, so it's time to begin our second session with another fantastic set of scholars. Uh, we'll keep the discussion going, but we're gonna shift gears a little bit to consider a related topic, the rising backlash we've seen in recent years against international cooperation generally and specific international organizations uh, such as the European Union and the World Trade Organization. The last few years have, to put it mildly, not been banner years for international cooperation. Uh, in Europe, the UK is possibly, as Stephanie will tell us, on the cusp of Brexit, uh, and populist and nationalist parties opposed to the EU have risen to power in Hungary, in Poland, possibly in Italy, depending on how you classify those parties. Uh, in the US, the Trump administration has withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Accords, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and the president in repeated public remarks has cast doubt on our commitment to NATO and the WTO. Uh, more broadly, several countries have now withdrawn from the International Criminal Court, uh, and countries such as China are starting new initiatives such as the Belt and Road Project and the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank that may pose serious challenges to the core institutions of global governance. So we're interested in this panel in understanding what is driving this backlash against international cooperation and institutions, whether the US-led, quote, liberal world order is collapsing or whether it will endure in the face of these challenges, and what the future of international governance looks like in trade, finance, security, uh, and other issue areas. Uh, and again, perhaps as many of us have been trying to figure out for the last two years, 24 hours, seven weeks, et cetera, what ultimately is going to happen with Brexit in the UK. Uh, so to help us answer these questions, we're fortunate to have three of the leading political scientists of international cooperation and institutions with us today. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome them, uh, especially because they're longtime friends and colleagues. Uh, so first we have Lisa Martin, who is Professor of Political Science here at UW-Madison, uh, as well as Associate Dean of the Graduate School. Uh, Lisa is one of the real giants in the field in the study of international organizations and international cooperation. Uh, her books, Coercive Cooperation, Explaining Multilateral Sanctions and Democratic Commitments, Legislatures and International Cooperation, were published by Princeton University Press and are classics in the study of strategic interna interaction in international relations and the links between domestic politics and international cooperation. Lisa served as editor-in-chief of International Organization from 2002 to 6, which is the top journal in international relations and political science. Uh, she remains on the board of IO and pretty much every other journal in political science. Uh, she's co-editor of the University of Michigan series in international political economy and vice president of the American Political Science Association. Uh, Lisa received her PhD in government from Harvard University, where she was on faculty in many years, uh, before moving to Madison and having the misfortune of me not only as her colleague now, but also as her student then, uh, when she was in Cambridge. Uh, we also have Christoph Pelk, uh, who is Associate Professor and William Dawson Scholar in the Department of Political Science at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, Christoph's research focuses on international rules and institutions and how some rules, uh, as we've been discussing, benefit some countries more than others. Much of Christoph's work has looked, specific, has looked specifically at the rules of the World Trade Organization and the international investment regime. Uh, his 2016 book, Making and Bending International Rules, The Design of Exceptions and Escape Clauses in Trade Law, was published by Cambridge University. Uh, Christoph has also appeared and published in the media frequently on topics related to international trade, uh, NAFTA and the USMCA, the WTO, TPP, and Canada's role in the global economy. And Christoph received his PhD in political science from Georgetown University. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we have Stephanie Ricard, who is professor in the Department of Government at the London School of Economics. Uh, Stephanie is an expert in the political economy of international trade and finance and the connections between domestic politics and international negotiations, focusing on the WTO trade agreements and the International Monetary Fund. Her 2018 book, Spending to Win, Political Institutions, Economic Geography and Geographic Subsidies, was published by Cambridge University Press, and it's part of a broader set of publications uh, of Stephanie's on how electoral institutions and economic geography affect government spending. Uh, Stephanie has been uh, frequently on the BBC and other media outlets to discuss the global economy, Brexit, the IMF, the WTO, uh, and we're eager again to hear what she has to say about developments across the pond. Uh, Stephanie received her PhD in political science from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our guests.
Uh, and again, each will speak for roughly 15 minutes. Uh, I will add in a couple questions and comments, and then we'll open up uh, for your questions from the audience. I don't know Max, so I'm guessing. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you. Um, so thanks very much, I'm really happy to be here and happy to see all of you and looking forward to your questions. Um, I'm gonna take a very sort of big picture view here, right, and talk about the liberal international order very broadly defined um, and ask about the basic question, are rumors of the liberal international order's demise exaggerated? Um, so I think the first thing that we need to do um, is to think about what do we mean by the liberal international order. It's a term that political scientists and journalists and others throw around constantly, but I wanna think a little bit more about what do we actually mean here. So this is the order that generally speaking has existed since 1945, used to call it the post-war international order. Um, what I'm gonna focus on in my uh, brief comments here are just to focus on the parts of the order that are generally global, that is, that aspire to be universal. So I'm gonna focus on the parts of the order that are, in, at least in theory, uh, open to all states that are willing to accept their rules. That is, as I said, that aspire to be universal. I think it's important to note this because there are, of course, a lot of regional orders out there. And those regional orders are, to varying degrees, liberal or not. And they overlap with and intersect with, right, these, these more global institutions. But I wanna draw our attention to these, these generally open institutions. Um, the liberal order is rule-based. But this is not unique to the liberal order. There's plenty of orders historically and alternative orders that are rule-based but that are not liberal. So the Concert of Europe, for example, is a good historical example of a rule-based international order, but one that we would not recognize as a liberal order from today's perspective. And then finally, just in very general terms, one thing to say about the liberal international order is that it's, it's layered on what we refer to as the Westphalian order, right? So this is the basic idea of state sovereignty. So uh, underlying principles of state sovereignty, non-interference have been the basis of the modern state system for centuries. And this liberal order has been layered on top of that. And as we'll see, there's some very strong tensions, right, uh, between these, this underlying notion of state sovereignty and non-interference and what is currently going on with many aspects of the uh, international liberal order. Um, then I wanted to focus in on this concept of liberal, right? So now I've talked a little bit about what is an order. Now I wanna talk about what is liberal about the liberal international order. And I think we can identify basically three different types of liberalism in the order. Um, first of all, it is at its historical core, going back to political philosophy, um, talking about some order being liberal or anything being liberal means referring to pr uh, principles of the universal equality of individuals. So principles such as individual freedom, self-determination, these are really core to any kind of system that we're going to refer to as liberal. So we might think of this as political liberalism, right? These underlying ideals of universal equality, self-determination, and so on. We can also think about dimensions of the liberal order that are more about economic liberalism. Uh, the form that economic liberalism has taken uh, since 1945 through today has actually varied quite a bit over time. And I wouldn't be surprised if we hear more about that a little later this afternoon. Um, but in the early post-war era, uh, the form that liberalism took was really what John Ruggie referred to as embedded liberalism, right? So market capitalism, globalization, but very much supported by and protected by social structures such as the welfare state. And this has evolved over time to what some authors have referred to as hyperglobalization, right? A much more neoliberal vision in which the social welfare state has been undermined, the rules that constrained uh, capitalism to some extent, such as capital controls, right, have been stripped away. And th so the form of economic liberalism has shifted over time. And there's, of course, huge debates about the costs and benefits of these different forms of economic liberalism. And then finally, on the international level, I think what's really going on with the liberal international order is what we refer to as principled multilateralism. Again, going back to some extent to, to John Ruggie's work. So the idea of principled multilateralism is that the order operates on along the lines of generalized principles of conduct. And an example of this is what just came up at the previous um, panel, which is that the WTO is supposed to level the playing field, right, by having rules that are to a large extent applicable to all members, it's supposed to level the playing field and not have different rules for big states, rich states, poor states, small states, and so on. So that's what we think of as, again, principled multilateralism, generalized principles of conduct, 
And again, this is what I would think of as sort of the international dimension of the international liberal order, this, this strong reliance on multilateralism, multilateral institutions, and so on. So then in order to try to visualize this international liberal order, um, I and a couple of colleagues have come up with what we refer to as the liberal mountain range. So again, we're thinking here about global institutions, and we think about this liberal order as primarily operating in four different um, issue areas, which is the security issues, economic issues, uh, human rights issues, and environment. You could certainly add other issues in here, but these are four very prominent ones. So in each of these issue areas, as you can see, the base of the triangle or the mountain in each of these is the Westphalian order, right? These principles of state sovereignty, non-interference, states as being the parties that sign on to global agreements and so on are really still there, right, in all of these different issue areas. But then as you move up, you move um, to some extent away from those basic Westphalian principles to these more liberal principles, right? So as you move up, you start to surrender or delegate some forms of state sovereignty. States agree to, to bind their hands. They might agree to actually you know, arbitrate disputes instead of uh, having the right of self-help and so on. Um, as you move up to the narrowing of the triangle is supposed to represent that fewer and fewer states buy into, right? or participate in these more liberal elements of the order, right? Some really are firmly hanging on to these more Westphalian principles. So if we think first of all about, um, just to take a couple of minutes on this, the, and I have to put on my glasses to see my own, <coughs> my own thing, um, the security issue, right? So based on Westphalian sovereignty, the next step up there might be moving towards UN membership, right? By becoming a member of the UN, you sign on to certain principles, you might participate in peacekeeping operations, right? You might uh, engage in various um, collective security kinds of activities that again bind states to at least some minor extent. Then moving beyond that, if you think about um, different kinds of um, alliances, that might be one step beyond that. And then finally, at sort of the peak of this particular little triangle, um, we think about things such as bans and certain kinds of weapons, right? So bans and weapons of mass destruction, landmine bans, that kind of thing. These are actually a pretty significant surrender of state sovereignty, right? Saying that under no conditions are you allowed to develop these kinds of weapons. And signing onto that is, again, a pretty significant sign of states tying their hands. Um, in economics, you can sort of describe a similar kind of, of moving away from state sovereignty. So the first step might be moving to, say, development institutions, right? Participating in the World Bank, uh, various kinds of, of development institutions like that. Again, not a major surrender of state sovereignty, but you do agree to participate in multilateral actions to refrain from undermining some of these issues and so on. And then the next step beyond that might be what we think of as the, the major multilateral economic institutions, some of which we've already discussed, such as the WTO, um, International Monetary Fund. Again, when you agree to participate fully in these organizations, you do accept certain self-constraints, right? You are, agree to dispute resolution mechanisms, you agree to not uh, have severe capital controls and that kind of thing. Um, the other two issue areas I'd highlight, um, human rights and the environment, I depict these as having taller peaks because I think at the most extreme, you're actually surrendering even more sovereignty in these issue areas if you go all the way and buy into these principles. So in human rights, again, the very basic level beyond Westphalian sovereignty is to sign on to the UN Human Rights Accords. Right, so the basic human rights conventions, now the Convention Against Torture has been added into there. Again, constraining yourself, but not to a very significant degree. An important step beyond that might be the International Criminal Court. Right, so that's a pretty substantial surrender of sovereignty, one that the United States has not agreed to, right? It doesn't participate in the ICC. And here you're saying that actually citizens of your country can be prosecuted by this international court for carrying out various types of crimes against humanity, right? And that, again, is a pretty substantial surrender of sovereignty. And then finally, at the peak here, you might think about R2P, or, right, or the responsibility to protect. And so the responsibility to protect is really a complete inversion of the Westphalian order, right? Here you're not saying that it's a principle of non-interference. Here it's saying that you have a responsibility to interfere, right? When various crimes against humanity are, are happening, you have a responsibility to interfere and try to correct those. So very substantial, I think, surrender of sovereignty. And then finally, just to mention briefly the environmental issue area, um, again, I think you have some of our basic environmental accords that have been signed onto quite widely, such as the Montreal Protocol or the Convention um, Against Trade in Endangered Species. 
Um, again, you're tying your hand to some extent, but, but not that extremely. On the other hand, if you think about what's going on with potential solutions to climate change, right, actually sign on to those agreements are potentially very serious, again, surrenders of sovereignty, right, agreeing to really, you know, move towards decarbonization um, in various ways, really cutting back on what you're doing. So that's sort of the extreme out there. So that's sort of what I think of as the liberal order. Then finally, uh, just to talk about some of the challenges to the order. Um, so first of all, to note that this liberal international order has survived some various serious challenges uh, before. Um, and just to mention a few of them, the end of the Bretton Woods monetary regime in the early 1970s, later in that decade, the OPEC oil embargoes, um, then the end of the Cold War. You know, every, there were plenty of people who predicted the end of the liberal order, right, it, at each of those junctures. And it survived. So to some extent, you might argue this liberal order seems fairly robust. Um, however, I do think that, at least from my perspective now, I think that there are some differences in what we're seeing today. For one thing, what we see today is that challenges to the liberal order now are very much coming from the core, right, the core members of this order, from, from the UK, right, from the United States. And so that can be quite challenging. Um, at the same time, you have rising powers, such as primarily China, right, who have very different visions of world order. So between the, the combination of challenges coming from the core and clear alternatives rising, that I think does present a very serious challenge to the liberal international order. Um, another very <clears throat> excuse me, serious challenge that has been mentioned is the rise of populist nationalism and many times populist nationalist movements with um, authoritarian characteristics in that they reject a lot of liberal principles. And one estimate that's out there is that in Europe today, about one third of governments are either constituted by or uh, dependent on populist nationalist movements. So a very serious you know, threat to some of these underlying liberal principles. And then finally, as has already been mentioned, right, this undermining of multilateral institutions, we focus so far on the WTO, which is maybe the most serious, but obviously undermining NATO, right, a lot of, a lot of other challenges to multilateralism. So, so I think there are some very serious challenges out there. I am not at all sort of confident that this liberal order is going to prove as robust as it has in the past. And so finally, I just wanted to conclude by thinking about some of the lessons that if we have not already learned, I think we need to learn really fast, okay? And I think some of these lessons are, first of all, that orders um, exclude as well as include, right? So I think when we reflect back on what many of us in political science see as the successes of the liberal international order, we really are thinking about the core, right? And how great it's been for the North Atlantic, for, for rich states. Um, and this order has obviously expanded over time, but many states have been excluded. And as we heard earlier, it's gonna be very tough for some of these states that are late entrants to ever have the kind of benefits from this order that we ever did. There's also some very interesting work, for example, on the racial bases, right, of the liberal international order. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which um, exclusion needs to be thought about more than I think we typically have. Um, another thing that I think should be quite obvious, this is something Christoph has written a lot about, is that orders are not neutral. Um, even if they're based on multilateral principles and rule-based, the effects of these rules are not neutral. And I think we need to be much more attentive to these distributional consequences on the international level, but also very much on the domestic level, right, of, of these rules and the kinds of inequities and equalities they might be creating. Um, thirdly, obviously, international orders have to be built on underlying societal interests to the extent that the underlying societal um, support for these orders is eroding, for example, through extreme inequality or exclusion on the domestic level. That's, that is ultimately going to undermine right, the international order. I should say that the liberal international order has always been basically an elite driven uh, process, right? And it was bought into because it provided a lot of benefits for a lot of people who were not elites. But to the extent, again, that that underlying support erodes through some of these populist movements, I think that really does fundamentally threaten this elite-driven project of the liberal order. And finally, just to sort of uh, say the obvious, domestic politics matters, right? So I think a lot of those of us who have studied the liberal international order have not paid sufficient attention to domestic politics. I think that many of the bureaucrats in these multilateral institutions do not see their job as thinking about domestic politics, right? They see their job as generating global benefits and how those benefits get distributed on the domestic level, well, that's the job of state governments. That's not their job. 
And that, I think, can be quite destructive in the long run. So to return to my initial question, um, is the liberal order uh, a goner or not? I think if we learn these lessons and think about their implications for reform, potential transformation of the order, it, it can survive and it, it can benefit more than it has in the past. But I do think there are some very serious challenges there. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Next up is Christoph Pell. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So I'm going to straddle some of the themes and questions of, of both of the panels. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, the malaise, the, the particular malady that we're facing today. I'm going to suggest that we actually, uh, there are known remedies to that malaise, and uh, they're being underprovided. And paradoxically, international institutions might have a role in remedying that in turn. So we've, again, been hearing about this already, so I'll go quickly over, over this. We know that uh, economic shocks have a range of political and social consequences. And this comes out of uh, the China shock studies, but also a range of natural experiments that have shown the extent to which um, when you have a shock that is, well, regionally concentrated, it tends to be associated with growing political polarization, um, individual values, and, and Stephanie's work has, uh, has shown the extent to which individuals will shift towards, for instance, authoritarian values in the case of uh, the United Kingdom, and especially uh, views on immigration, right? that uh, the more exposed you are to these localized economic shocks, the more likely you are to have negative attitudes towards immigration. And this seems to be operating especially through uh, what are called socio sociotropic preferences, meaning that individuals think in terms of groups. Right? So here's a nice quote from a recent book by John Sides and uh, some co-authors about how the essential sentiment is not really, I might lose my job, but that those in my group might lose their jobs to those in that other group. And what we've seen is that uh, right-wing parties are especially good at manipulating the, the, the relevant groups, right? And so they seem to gain from those economic shocks. And so what that entails is something that looks a lot like an economic recipe for political backlash. So you take an overall situation of steady growth, but then unevenness in that growth, meaning that you have these shocks that are, again, geographically concentrated. Uh, add some austerity. Right, and I'll show you that in the case of the United States, also in the case of, of Europe, and especially the United Kingdom. And then add some political entrepreneurs who want to capitalize on that, let it fester a bit, and you have something that looks an awful lot like what we're seeing across developed democracies. Right? So we see a, a range of countries that have followed this recipe kind of to a T. Right? The nice thing about having an economic recipe for uh, backlash is that perhaps we have an antidote as well. And so I'll suggest that that's the case here. Governments can uh, prevent the succession of events, but um, they haven't been very good at doing so. If anything, we're, we're, we're seeing kind of a retrenchment of the kinds of policies that would slow down uh, the sequence of events. And, and again, this is where I think Paradoxically, because they're also, in a way, in a way the culprit, international, international institutions might play a role. And this is going to be a little uh, willfully utopian, but I'm the, I'm the Canadian on the panel, so, so that's my role. <laughs> so what I'm thinking of here is uh, trade adjustment, so targeted compensation to those who are uh, left behind. And the U.S. happens to have the biggest and longest standing um, program that does trade adjustment. It's called TAA, uh, Trade Adjustment Assistance. It's been around since 1960s. It really came into its own in the 1970s, but it was, it was created under President Kennedy. Uh, it's a billion dollar program. We have a lot of data on this, and we have a lot of regional data, which makes it especially valuable. Here's the thing. No one likes this program. Uh, Republicans think it's too uh, too big. Democrats think it's too small, but then uh, union leaders think that they call it burial insurance. Uh, it shifts workers from unionized to non-unionized sectors. And so as a result, it's really a kind of a victim of a lot of um, political horse trading and the like. And yet, if you look at it, it's a very effective program in a lot of ways. So it provides income insurance. It provides uh, Mobility, insure, uh, mobility payments, so if you have a job in Dakota, you get to move to Dakota and the, 
program pays for it, it provides medical insurance, and so it's on paper the kind of thing that, well, we would like to see. Moreover, and this is from uh, some of my own ongoing work, it turns out that TA compensation uh, had a big role to play in modulating the Trump effect in the 2016 elections. So areas that saw more compensation were less likely to, well, to see that effect of the economic shocks shifting uh, their views towards uh, voting for Trump. That said, there's been a big shortfall in the provision of TA, I'll show you that in a second, and guess what? Protectionism, trade protectionism, has been filling in. So here's a picture, um, all the red is where going from the 1990s to the 2000s, compensation through TAA has gone down in its responsiveness, meaning for a given amount of trade shock, we're providing less compensation, right? The takeaway is that there's very little blue, meaning more responsiveness, and there's an awful lot of red. And here's the, the second takeaway. All those red zones correlate to an awful degree with shifts from voting for Obama to or vote Trump in 2016. Here's the, the second point I want to, to bring, which is that insofar as this labor dislocation has um, spillover effects, trade adjustment also has, uh, well, should be seen as a public good. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, when you have untreated domestic pain of the kinds that, that we're seeing with uh, this exposure to uh, the China shock and the like, right, uneven growth, if you leave that untreated, there's great temptation to uh, shift it to other countries. Shift it, for instance, to your trade partners. Right? So here's a quote from one uh, Danny Roderick. <laughs> about how the best way in which nations can serve the global good in the economic sphere is by putting their own economic houses in order, right? Take uh, care of your own economy first. And that makes a lot of sense, right? And grows from a skepticism about the international rules. Uh, here's, to me, the danger here, which is that one way of doing that, of uh, putting your own economic house in order, is to dump the pain next door, right, is to indulge in protectionist impulses. And that's what we're seeing, right? So um, I don't know the extent to which you can see the, the underlying map, right, but the same US map um, under the red circles. The red circles are demands for trade protection. This is actually the first such map, as far as I know. Uh, it comes from all of this, so it comes from thousands of anti-dumping investigations where we find all the uh, factories cited in every investigation and we geolocate them. And, well, what you can see is that, as you might expect, there's all these demands for protectionism in um, Ohio, Michigan, um, and Rust Belt, right? So what, uh, and here you have both the demands for trade adjustment, for TAA petitions, and uh, for uh, protectionism, and the story here is that, again, protectionism fills in where trade adjustment falls short, right? So demands are happening in the same way, and there's an interesting kind of chronology to this, which, which I, can, I can talk about some more. Uh, so, so here's this last point. Knowing what we know about, on the one hand, this economic malaise, on the other, the extent to which actually these compensation strategies work in alleviating the political effects of these economic shocks, trade adjustments should be seen as something of a public good, meaning something that countries uh, do not benefit or do not get all the benefits of. And as a result, we know about public goods and the rule is that they're underprovided. What that means is that China has a real stake in trade adjustment in the US, right? Because it um, bears the brunt of this backlash. And what that means, given the domestic difficulty of providing the kind of correct, socially, globally correct level of trade adjustment, is that international institutions play, a, and again, this is where the utopian side comes in, play a potential role here, right? So when you have uh, difficulty in providing a public good, the international level provides a potential solution, where you commit to, much as in the way of uh, the Paris Agreement, you commit to providing the 
the socially, uh, globally correct level of that public good. And so one thing to do here, one thing to imagine would be to package commitments on trade liberalization and commitments on domestic redistribution together at the international level. Right? There's a lot of uh, nostalgia these days for the good old days of embedded liberalism from the, for the 50s, 60s, and 70s when um, countries were free to uh, choose their domestic system while being constrained internationally. But all that that was was policy space. There was really no assurance that countries would redistribute. And so here's that proposal in this case, that one way of doing that specifically, and this gets a little, little wonkier, and, and this is one of these instruments that I've been especially interested in, which is the WTO escape clause, that one could package the use of the escape clause where countries get to suspend the rules temporarily to deal, to adjust um, domestically, uh, to essentially put up trade barriers to protect an industry, and uh, package that with a commitment to providing redistribution for that industry. Right? So you would kind of anticipate the need for adjustment in a given industry. And so again, current malaise, we have some of the remedies readily at hand, but they're being underprovided. One of the ways of remedying that in turn is to use the international level. And to come full circle, International institutions allow us to do this kind of extraordinary thing, which is to self-bind in a way that gets us to do the things that we would like to do, but that domestic politics make very difficult to do. And that's a pretty radical thing, and I think it's one that uh, bears remembering, especially now. Thank you. Thanks, Christoph. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here and be part of this discussion, and I look forward to your questions. Mark tasked us with asking and answering the question or discussing the backlash against international cooperation and in institutions. And I ask you, is there a better example of the backlash against international cooperation and in institutions than Brexit? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, is the case of Brexit. And even if you're not interested in British politics or Britain, it is a potentially interesting case of a country who's chosen to walk away from international cooperation. They've chosen to withdraw from an international institution. So it is an interesting case, even if you're not interested in British politics. So I'm gonna to try to do two things today in the brief time I have. First, I'm gonna talk about the causes of Brexit. How did we get here? What caused Brexit? And second, Think towards the future. What are the consequences of Brexit? What might it mean for future cooperation and future international institutions or the sustainability of international institutions going forward? So just a few brief facts. This was an outcome of a nationwide referendum on EU membership where there's a very simple decision. There were two boxes on the ballot. Should we remain in the EU or not? Very simple. In a really shocking result, that was a shock and a surprise even to the leaders of the Leave campaign, 52% of people voted to leave the European Union. No one expected this. And so we know that 17.4 million Britons voted to leave the European Union, but this total overlooks big, important geographic variation in areas of the country that were very solidly leave and other areas of the country that were very solidly remain. So I'm showing you here a graph of the United Kingdom. Uh, Northern Ireland is not here, but they also voted remain. So the areas in yellow are the areas where more people voted remain than leave. And the areas in blue are areas where more people voted leave than remain. And you, what strikes you right away is the geographic division in the country, the geographic concentration of leave voting and remain voting. So you can see that the remain vote is strongest up north in Scotland where we see a large support for remaining in the European Union. We also see a lot of support for remaining in the European Union in London and the southeast of England. So for example, in my borough in London where I live, 75% of us voted to remain in the European Union. In contrast, in Boston, which is that dark blue on the east coast there, 75% of people voted to leave the European Union. So this is an issue that's extremely divisive but it's also geographically dividing us. There's these big concentrations of leave voters in some areas and remain voters in other areas. 
So when we think about asking, well, what caused Brexit? Another way to ask that question is, why is there such significant geographic variation in support to leave or remain? Why are some regions of the country so strongly in favor of remain and other regions are so strongly in favor of leave? So I'm gonna to contend to you that one really important explanation is economic geography. So economic geography refers to the geographic distribution of jobs, of economic opportunities, of economic production, and just as in the United States, where there's big regional variation in jobs, in employment opportunities, in economic production, so too is there big economic or geographic inequalities in economic opportunities in the United Kingdom. So the labor market, the job opportunities, the economic diversity in London and the southeast of the country is extremely different from what you see in the Midlands, where there's very few jobs, very few employment opportunities. And so I would contend to you that economic geography is a really important part of the Brexit story. But it's not just important for Brexit. I think it's in more, important more generally for things that we're seeing in the United States, for example. This increase in income inequality is in part related to economic geography and where we see jobs concentrating, where we see economic opportunities concentrating. So I wrote a book last year where I traced through how economic geography matters, because I do think it's important, and I think we're not talking enough about it. And so in the book, I trace through how economic ge geography matters for what voters want, what voters are demanding from the government. It also affects the decisions governments are making. Government policy decisions are shaped in part by the economic uh, geography in the country, by the geographic distribution of jobs and employment opportunities and economic production. And the part that I'm going to really focus on here with you today is the impact of globalization and how that relates to economic geography. You know, countries are more or less open to trade. Some countries are very open to trade, but even when a country is open to trade, not all regions in that country are equally exposed to trade and globalization. Some regions in the country are going to be more impacted by globalization and trade than other regions. And I think that is a really important part of the Brexit story, is how the economy in the United Kingdom was unevenly exposed to globalization. So here I'm showing you again the map of the country, and I'm showing you import penetration. And I'm focusing here specifically on Chinese import penetration, but I'm trying to get a sense of how exposed different regions in the United Kingdom are to foreign imports. How exposed are they to this aspect of globalization? And the lighter colors are showing you less exposure to globalization, less exposure to these foreign imports. And right away you'll see Scotland is much less exposed to globalization than the Midlands of the country. The middle of the country is highly exposed to these foreign imports coming in from China. The southeast of the country is relatively less exposed. So it strikes you right away that the pattern of exposure to foreign trade looks very similar to the pattern of leave voting. And in fact, there is a strong and positive correlation between foreign imports and support for voting leave. So we see this positive correlation where the more you're exposed to foreign imports, the more you're voting leave. So why might that be the case? Why might there be this correlation between exposure to foreign trade and voting to leave the European Union? Well, one possibility is that this exposure to foreign trade generates economic insecurity. There's research out there that suggests uh, that when you're more exposed to these foreign trade flows, there's greater volatility in wages, there may be an average decline in wages, there's greater volatility in jobs. You may feel more economically insecure in terms of both your job and in terms of your income. And so potentially it's the case then that these areas of the country that were more exposed to foreign trade were more economically insecure, and that led voters to say, we're not sure globalization is a great thing. We're not sure we want to be part of this union that is engaging in free trade and opening us up to the, to the global economy. I would contend that a second really important part of the story, though, is austerity. So we see parts of the country becoming economically insecure because of exposure to globalization. And at the same time, the government is cutting spending programs and in sort of exacerbating or exaggerating this economic insecurity. So here I'm showing you real aggregate spending cuts per capita across several different spending areas. And what will strike you is right in 2010, when the conservatives got into government, 
We see cuts in some of these key spending areas. We see cuts in education, welfare and protection, and healthcare. So all of these programs that could potentially help people feel less economically insecure are actually getting cut. And so I think that this is potentially an important part of the story. And again, not all parts of the country were equally exposed to these austerity cuts. I'm showing you here austerity incidents across the country. The blue colors are where there's lower austerity cuts. This is projected financial loss per working adult. Those are in blue. The higher those cuts are, you become light blue and then red. And again, right away you see that the, the smallest austerity cuts are concentrated in uh, Scotland and then the southeast of the country. The biggest austerity cuts are being felt in the Midlands and in that east coast area by the Boston uh, region. So here we have what I'm going to say is sort of a double shock. You have areas of the country that are more exposed to globalization, where workers are potentially feeling more economically insecure. They're at risk of losing their jobs. They're at greater risk of seeing volatility in their wages and their income. And at the same time, these same regions are more exposed to austerity cuts. The government is not helping them. In fact, they're doing the opposite. They're cutting welfare spending, unemployment insurance, uh, health care. So it looks like um, there's some evidence to suggest, I should say, that evidence that individuals that were exposed to these austerity cuts were, in fact, more likely to vote for Brexit. If you were a welfare recipient and you experienced a cut in your welfare benefits, it made you more likely to vote for Brexit. So it looks like perhaps both of these played an important role in the Brexit vote. Economic insecurity generated from exposure to international trade and these austerity cuts that were making you feel even more insecure than you already were. So there's some potential important policy implications. And here I'm going to echo a lot of what Christoph said. Governments can influence public support for international cooperation. The government's policy choices at home can influence how the public feels about international cooperation. By compensating the workers who are made economically insecure from globalization, be it increased healthcare spending, increased welfare spending, unemployment protection, potentially governments can help to sustain support for economic openness. But failure to do so may lead to disintegration. And I think that's part of the story of Brexit. Workers were economically insecure because of their exposure to foreign imports, and the government failed to reassure them or failed to offset the costs of globalization, failed to offset this economic security using public policy. So I've addressed the causes of Brexit or some of the potential causes of Brexit. Let me talk a little bit about the consequences of Brexit. So we might want to ask, how might Brexit matter for the future of the European Union? Is this, as some have suggested, the first domino to fall? and that this is the first instance of disintegration that we've seen, and we're just going to see more and more and more states leaving the European Union. I'm going to suggest the answer to that question is no, in part because we've seen public support for the European Union increase in other member countries since Brexit. So the UK votes to leave, and other member countries actually become more supportive of the European Union. So here I'm showing you polling data uh, from European Union countries, and you can see that this is telling you how, what percentage of the country says membership in the EU is a good thing for my country. And in 2015, before Brexit, on average, about 55% of people are saying that. In 2018, 60% of people are saying that. So we're seeing the highest support for the European Union that we've seen in 35 years. And in fact, it's risen since Brexit. The same is true if you ask uh, respondents, has your country benefited from being a member of the European Union? In 2015, it was about 60% of people that said this. In 2018, 67%. So I'm showing you averages here, but every single member country of the European Union, bar two, have seen support for the European Union rise after Brexit. The two for which this does not hold are Germany and Hungary. And we know that they have their own sort of politics going on in those countries about the European Union. But all the other countries, I know this is hard for you to see, take my word for it, all the other countries, bar Germany and Hungary, have seen an increase in support for the European Union after Brexit happened. So I would contend that Brexit is an isolated instance of disintegration. It's not foreshadowing the future of the European Union falling apart. It's not the first domino. I would argue it's an isolated instance of disintegration. 
It's an instance of disintegration that happened not because of the country's involvement in the global economy, but rather primarily because of the government's policies decisions. They did not actively work to make citizens feel secure, to offset the costs of globalization. And these domestic policy choices that the government made played a really important role in the voters' decision to move away from international cooperation. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, so a, a lot of really great and thoughtful things to think about here. So I have questions for each of you, but they overlap. So you can feel free to uh, pick a little bit from each, each of the menus. Uh, so for, for Lisa, um, I really like this idea of thinking about multiple orders and multiple ways to conceptualize order. Um, that raises the question of whether we might see the collapse or partial collapse of one but not the others. Right? And so I sort of wonder how much, how much are these dominoes, right? where if one goes down, the others go down as well, um, and how we think about that. Um, I also have a question um, about how much is the order, you presented the order as institutional, others talk about the order as being hegemonic, right? and that the real foundations of the order were not the, the international organizations and institutions, but American power and hegemony. Uh, and so, does that vary across these different orders? How does power and American willingness and ability to play the role of the hegemon fit in? Um, and then finally, I think it, the very, very good point about thinking about the order, uh, the order excluded, right? Countries that were not part of the North Atlantic. Uh, in many ways, this may be the fundamental trade-off. Can we actually balance maintaining the, enough of the benefits for the traditional beneficiaries of the order while also incorporating uh, other countries like China and other uh, emerging market and developing countries. Uh, Christoph, um, I, I love the term pain dumping, right? And I like the idea of trade adjustment assistance as uh, anti-pain dumping and that international organizations may, uh, may have a role here. Um, but I, the thing that struck me the most was thinking about um, the four things you put together. So economic growth, the localized shock, austerity, and entrepreneurs. Um, and Stephanie touched on this a bit, but the thing we seem to actually not have talked very much about is the austerity, right? So we've talked a lot about the localized shocks. We've talked a lot about the absence of economic growth in the aggregate. And we've talked a lot about political entrepreneurs, like Trump and Orban and uh, Nigel Farage and you know, diff different actors in different countries. Uh, so I guess the question I have is, why isn't the answer actually just au less austerity, right? Especially because the countries that uh, we're talking about in the North Atlantic are not countries that are actually constrained, right, in their ability to borrow and spend in the way that developing countries are. So um, I like this idea that IOs may actually be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Uh, but per the quote that you put up of Danny's actually, getting your own house in order to some extent means less austerity in the Eurozone countries, less austerity in the United States, and less austerity in the UK. Um, and is that the, is that the root problem? Um, and then, uh, Stephanie, I thought the, thinking about the economic geography is fascinating and the, the maps really are, are, are insightful. Um, the map you didn't show and the one you didn't talk about is immigration. Right, um, and so, so my big question about Brexit is, uh, you do see, I think, on the import penetration, right, and, and austerity, uh, but my sense with immigration actually is the pattern is reversed, and we see that in the US as well. Opposition to immigration is actually in places in the country where there is the least immigration, right? And so if you think about the Midlands versus London, right, versus Edinburgh, or Glasgow, actually there's a lot less immigration, yet the debate, the domestic debate about Brexit was a lot about immigration. Right, and not as much about uh, not as much about trade. So, how do we think about that? Um, and then I have to ask the sort of forward-looking question. So, we all kind of want to know um, what's going to happen on April twelfth or May twenty-second. Um, and regardless of what happens on April twelfth and May twenty-second with Brexit, uh, do you actually think that we're there? There's still a risk of a breakup of the UK in the sense of a Scottish referendum or pressure um, to solve the Irish border problem by unification in Ireland. Um, and so help, I think, is my general cry in, uh, in that regard. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Those are 
those are excellent and very hard questions. Um, we could spend a long time debating them. Um, so maybe just a few things. So um, first of all, Mark asked about whether there really are multiple orders, right? I talked about the liberal international order, but obviously you have, as I said, issue specific versions of that uh, liberal order. And the question is whether these um, different issue specific orders or sub orders can be decoupled from one another, right? If, if one comes down, do they all come down? And I think my answer to that is that it, it depends on the reasons that a particular order is being attacked, right? So if you're attacking the multilateral economic institutions because they're generating inequality and doing all these things, and so there's a substantive reason that you're attacking them, trying to reform them, trying to develop alternatives, I don't think that necessarily spills over, right, into what's going on with collective security or with tackling climate change. But if you're attacking orders on the basis that I reject multilateralism, right, that the domestic support for universal equality is gone, that we're moving towards exclusionism, nationalism, then I think that does tr threaten everything, right? I mean, I think then these different orders, because they do rest on underlying common principles, once those principles themselves are the object of attack, as opposed to substantive outcomes and problems, then I think the whole thing is in trouble. Um, and I think we're seeing some of each, right? I mean, in the attacks that we see, some are substantive and I think very well grounded. Some I think are more a basic rejection of the underlying principles. And I think that is something that, that threatens all of them. And you know, if you won't support you know, collective security on principle because you don't wanna pay the cost and you think everybody else is free riding, that's gonna undermine a lot of these other kinds of institutions as well. Um, the hegemony versus institutions question is a good one. Um, here I think I would um, refer back to works by people like Bob Gilpin and John Eikenberry. And what these people, uh, theorists argue is that um, hegemons, very powerful states, if they're farsighted, recognize they're not gonna be hegemonic forever, right? And so what they do is they develop institutions that work in their interests, but that distribute benefits to a lot of others. And in a way, those institutions sort of perpetuate their hegemony, right? Sort of those principles that the hegemon put in place extend even as their power declines. And I think that's very much what we have seen, right? With this post-war order, the liberal international order, as I referred to it, it's why these institutions have been robust, right? Even as the US pulled the plug on Bretton Woods or you know these kinds of things. Um, so I think they're, they're, they're tightly related, right? But you know, you do have to think about, does there come a point where the hegemon not only is not acting in a hegemonic manner anymore, but it's actively undermining the institutions that it itself created, then you have trouble. And I think that's sort of where we are today, right? It's not just a lack of a hegemon, it's actively undermining your own creations, and that's the difficult thing. Um, and then finally, just on you know, the, the issue of can we um, include those who have been typically excluded from the liberal international order. You know, technically, obviously, yes, right? I mean, the, you can't really study the effects of the WTO on trade flows anymore because everybody's in the WTO, right? So um, there's, you know, so technically it is true that you can include. To me, I think one of the big questions um, is how do, the, how do the institutions themselves change as they become more inclusive, right? So as you include uh, states with very different forms of domestic economies, very different regime types on the, um, on the domestic level, you know, do you have to change the international institutions to accommodate them? And I think that has varied, right, across these different issues. So the, the IMF has just said no, right? I mean, we're, the IMF is gonna do what the IMF is gonna do, and we don't, we don't care if you don't like it. Um, the WTO, I think, has been somewhat more accommodating, but not a lot. A lot of the aid organizations, I think, have been more adaptive to sort of spreading things around, doing things in a slightly different way. Um, so I, I think, you know, that, I think it's an open question. I mean, I, I think technically you can become more inclusive, um, but whether you, whether you can keep enforcing the same rules as you become more inclusive, I think, is, is the really tricky thing. Thanks. So if I can maybe start by, by building a bit on uh, Lisa's second point. So it's absolutely true that the U.S. is undermining the very system that it largely helped create. Uh, that said, this is not the first time it's happening. So the precedent for this is the 1970s. Um, Menzi used the word, uh, the term aggressive unilateralism earlier. That term was coined in 1974 when the US created something called Section 301, which is a uh, 
unilateral enforcement mechanism that the US, uh, that a, a disenchanted Congress at the time pushed for to go after the foe at the time, which was not China, but Japan. Uh, it's striking to see the extent to which the rhetoric that is today being used against China was then used uh, against Japan. And what followed this period of unilateral uh, or aggressive unilateralism was, well, the most ambitious bout of liberalization and institution building and the creation of the WTO. And so in, in many ways, um, there's still suspicion, I think, that one possible outcome of the undermining could just be reform of one's form or another, not under Trump, but under a, a potential successor. So um, let's remember that the current blocking of appellate body judges at the World Trade Organization that we're seeing today did not start under Trump, it started under Obama. The US have a very specific grievance when it comes to uh, the dispute settlement system of the WTO, which has to do with uh, the treatment of binding precedent by the appellate body, really with regards to one thing called zeroing, which is a very boring um, technicality about how you measure dumping margins. That's, that's it. Um, and if you read the US statements on this, they're pretty coherent, right? They just want the appellate body to recognize that precedent is non-binding under public international law. And uh, the EU, for instance, has largely moved to this, uh, to kind of, kind of to accommodate the US. And I think that, that reform could happen and the WTO could actually emerge within a few years, largely uh, unscathed. And so to, then to Mark's question about austerity, I do think that th that is part of the solution to just have less of it, less austerity. That said, we know that, uh, well, political parties face conflicting incentives. And my point with this tying of domestic compensation with international institutions is that for now, WTO rules effectively impede domestic adjustment, economic adjustment. So trade remedies essentially defer, they delay adjustment. Uh, they allow countries to suspend the rules, put up trade barriers, and then adjustment doesn't happen. It's just that that industry is sheltered for a while and actually we see things that go in the opposite direction. There's often net um, entry into those industries. So there was for a long time until recently net entry into textiles in the US. Why? Because of, of little, um, these bouts of protection. And so the first uh, kind of order of business would be to just uh, uh, have these rules stop impeding uh, domestic adjustment, and then, and this is the utopian part, to potentially facilitate it. Uh, but we have to, to recognize that international rules potentially have a role to play in, again, facilitating domestic adjustment. So thanks for these questions, Mark. Um, you're right, immigration was an important part of the Brexit narrative. And I think it links in part to austerity. Because of the austerity cuts, there were fewer doctor's appointments. There were fewer nurses in the NHS. There were fewer uh, public housing uh, apartments available. And this became the narrative. I can't get public housing because the immigrants are getting it. I can't get a doctor's appointment because there are so many immigrants. And so I think that part of the problem was austerity, the cuts to public housing, the cuts to the NHS, and then the lack of availability of these goods provided by the government got blamed on immigrants. But you're absolutely right. The areas with the most immigrants were most likely to vote remain. The area with the least immigrants were most likely to vote leave. So you're right, the pattern is actually reversed for immigration. Interestingly, um, I used to live in Leicester, which is right in the middle of the Midlands, and that's a plurality South Asian city. I was the minority there, right? It was plurality South Asian. And that area, that region, they're not worried about immigration. They were a textile area. They, their economy was entirely based on textile mills. I actually lived in a former textile mill that was decimated by low-cost foreign imports. So even there in this region, that's a plurality South Asian city and area, it was still the foreign trade that seemed to dominate it. And in the econometric models, you can control for number of immigrants in this neighborhood and the trade shock still goes through, the austerity shock still goes through. So it was an important part of the narrative 
you're absolutely right. But I think that there is something about austerity that's really at the heart of uh, what happened in Brexit. What's going to happen on April 12th? <laughs> Who knows? A recent cabinet, cabinet minister gave that same answer in a much more colorful language than I can use here, but who knows? We don't know. Um, I, I am more and more concerned about a no-deal Brexit. I am more and more concerned that the UK will crash out of Brexit with no deal in place because of domestic politics. Each party involved has their own constituents that they're pandering to. They're not worried about the national interests. They're worried about their own uh, constituents. So we have the Conservative Party with these hard left, hard Brexit European Research Group members. We have the Labour Party completely ununified with a very weak leader who's not taking a position, who's not whipping uh, his MPs. We have you know, the DUP, this Northern Irish Party, that cannot consonants anything that would divide Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom. So I, I really think the risk of crashing out without a deal is higher than it's been in a while. And so I am, I am actually very nervous. Um, I said Brexit is an isolated instance of disintegration, but I think you're right. We could see further disintegration within the Union, right? So the United Kingdom is Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and England. Scotland could break off. We've seen them vote in a referendum recently. We could see another referendum where they say, you know what, we want to be in the EU. You know, we're not going to be part of the union anymore. And we already hear that kind of rhetoric coming out of the SNP. The same is true with Northern Ireland. We see Sinn Féin already coming out and saying, this is the time for a united Ireland. This is time for Northern Ireland to, become, to come back and be a united Ireland because of the threat of the exiting the European Union. So we may say further disintegration, but within the union. Thank you. All right, we have uh, time for audience questions. Uh, please raise your hand, and if you can, please be, uh, please be brief and make your questions questions and not speeches. So uh, we'll start with you. Uh, I've already touched on the fact that the EU is not Thank you very much for your questions, Ian. Um, you're right. I think I was focused on the, the trade aspect of globalization in terms of goods. But you're right. In terms of services, it's London. It's the financial services that are highly integrated in the global market. And they didn't feel the sort of economic insecurity that I think the manufacturing sector felt in the United Kingdom, right? The service sector, they were growing. They were booming. They were going forward. They thought they would continue to benefit from continued integration because they had benefited from integration. It was the manufacturing sector that wasn't benefiting from integration. They were the ones losing out, the textile mills in the Midlands that were getting shut down, the people who were losing their jobs, though. So they said, we're losing from globalization. Let's pull up the drawbridge. Let's retract. The service workers in London and the financial services, they're winning from globalization. They voted Remain because they want to continue there. So I agree, you're right. There's this different aspect of globalization, trade in goods versus trade in services. And I should be more honest about that. You're right. The demographic story is a good one. We know that people who are younger are more supportive of the EU. They're more cosmopolitan. They're more supportive of openness. And this is one of the arguments for why we should have a second vote, because all these new voters are going to come in. They're younger they can vote to remain. And so that's one of the arguments for let's potentially have a second referendum. It would be interesting to do the same map with the demographics. And I don't know what that would look like off the top of my head. I think that demographics played an important story, but not the entire story. And I think that what we see now going forward is that how you voted in the referendum is a stronger uh, identity marker than your party. So it's no longer like, I'm a conservative, I'm a Tory. 
that's not the identifier anymore. It's I voted leave, I voted remain. So this is interesting because the conservatives tended to be older. And even amongst these older groups, we've seen this fracturing in which side you're of the debate you're on. Are you a hard Brexiter? Are you a remain? Uh, so we're using uh, effectively, the, we're constructing the China shock, the uh, ADH shock for the UK. So we're looking at, manu it's only manufacturing, manufacturing uh, imports coming in from China, and then we're matching it based on the employment distribution. So it's exactly a replica of ADH, but in the United Kingdom. So we're looking at the change in uh, Chinese imports from 1990 to 2007, and then matching it onto the employment uh, profile of the district. Ex yeah, um, yes, exactly, because of the service sector, because they're so heavily engaged in the service sector, whereas the Midlands is more engaged in the, the goods sector. It does, yes, it does, yeah. Good question. And so it's just worth saying the extent to which this finding is replicated, so it start, this finding starts in the United States and is then replicated for Brexit, is replicated for uh, elections in uh, a dozen Western European uh, countries. We see the same correlation, and again, it's not a correlation because it's an identified causal effect. Or, or maybe That's not, as Phil tells us. <laughs> exactly, that, 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 that was my, my little hesitation oh, there. Uh, in, uh, in the case of France, with voting for the Front National, the, the National Front uh, for Le Pen, and so, uh, and, and indeed in Sweden. And so all these studies are using the same, uh, same design. And it's just about looking at you know, the industries, uh, uh, where is, uh, is there competition with imports at the industry level. So the industries that are in the Midlands are those that have to compete with China, whereas the industries in London don't, which is why you see this, um, uh, this map. Um, so we're here to talk a little bit about um, what's, like, the implications for having a member state of Ohio actively undermining the rules um, in the Iowa itself. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the implications for a, the state that is doing the undermining for like within an international cooperative arrangement and the implications for the organization itself. We just had the anniversary of NAFTA, and so there's been a lot more talk about um, kind of the U.S.'s role in NAFTA and um, different speeches that have been said with us. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little more about the implications for the state itself and for the organization. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, just kidding. Um, so first for the organization itself, I mean, I, I think one thing that we've learned, and Christoph has sort of referred to this, is that multilateralism as an organizing principle is remarkably resilient, right? I mean, you can get a lot of attacks, you can, the, the ground can shift under you, um, you can withhold funding, you can block um, appointment of appellate judges, and these institutions sort of just keep on going along. It's not to say they're always being as productive as they should be. Sometimes they become what um, someone has referred to as zombie institutions. But you, you know, the institutions are quite resilient. Um, not forever, but I think they can, you know, they can go on for a long time. Others can step up. They can recover. Um, I do think that the, the question about the implications for the state itself, I think, are, uh, are interesting. So I think what the international relations literature would tell you is that the main implication for the state that is undermining its own institutions is that it's going to lose its reputation, right? It's going to gain a reputation for being unreliable, uncooperative. It's going to be difficult for it to start new cooperative ventures. Um, I think one of the big unanswered questions in the literature is the extent to which that kind of reputation carries over from one issue area to another, right? So let's say that the US does manage to undermine NATO, right? Um, and you know, really just goes off in a completely direction with all bilateral alliances or something like that. 
Um, would that sort of reputation for not being willing to cooperate in multilateral security institutions necessarily carry over to international financial institutions or international trade institutions? I think that's that's unresolved. I mean, I you know I think there's a there's I think a lot of us on the theory side tend to think that these reputations are very portable and that what you do in one issue area is gonna hurt you in others. I'm not sure there's empirical evidence to support that. So again, I think there is some potential for decoupling these different issue areas from one another. And to that extent, then, the effect on the state itself is, I think, not as extreme. But I, I think another just uh, another issue to put out there, and I think that's lurking behind a lot of what people have been saying, is this whole idea of um, you know basically reforming the domestic political system, right? And I think what we're seeing emerging in quite a lot of places is you're seeing much more of an urban-rural divide, right? So at least in the developed world, often the the, co the main coalitions that formed were sort of the internationalist coalition versus the more domestically focused service sector kind of um, kind of coalition. And I think a lot of that is shifting. So in the United States, for example, agriculture has typically been part of the internationalist coalition, right? US is a big agricultural exporter. I think that is shifting, and I think we're seeing more of this urban-rural divide. I think potentially that leads to fundamental realignment of political parties, and to the extent that political actors are capitalizing on that, right, and reinforcing that realignment, I think that has very far-reaching um, implications for domestic politics. So I know the story best in the United States, but I think you can see elements of it more. I think that's sort of lurking in the Brexit story as well, right? You've seen the sort of regional divides that were not as prominent before. So I think that's um, I, I think that's one potential um, effect of some of the strategies that are being used by some of the more populist leaders out there. Yeah, I also had another uh, question about uh, international organizations. Um, why is there so frequently a double standard by? Uh, to whether or not a country can belong. An example would be uh, NATO, and that was founded. There was a requirement that the countries uh, be uh, democratic in, in nature, and yet Portugal was admitted as a charter member, which was most uh, undemocratic, and also Turkey the same uh, thing, um, whereas Spain was kept out for a similar reason. And the other example would be, I suppose, the UN, where the two Germanys and the two Koreas were kept out of the UN until the 1970s. So I'm just curious, what are the reasons for these strange uh, standards of membership? Yeah, so I think the first thing I should say, which I probably should have said before, is all the stuff I said about liberal principles and multilateral principles, those are all aspirational <laughs> principles. Right? They're, they're not applied even-handedly across the board. Um, so I, I think the basic story here for, I mean, you're absolutely right. There are double standards. You can find the same thing in economic institutions, human rights institutions, and so on, is that, again, think about this from the perspective of of powerful states. And these are powerful states that could go it alone if they wanted to. They don't have to participate in multilateral institutions. They often see it in their long run interest to participate in and support multilateral institutions, but they can afford to go it alone if they want to, as the United States does with the UN Security Council, right, at times. So in order for those states to remain invested in multilateral institutions, um, they, they need to, protect themselves to some extent, right? I mean, they, they sort of need to extract some rents from those institutions occasionally, right, in order to make it worthwhile for them to stay in. So I guess one sort of, again, big picture thing I would say is to the extent now that there's a lot of exit options, right? There's a lot of different institutions you can go to to do what you want to do, especially in the economic realm. That undermines the incentive for powerful states to continue investing in the core global multilateral institutions. And so I think as we've seen a proliferation of different types of institutions out there, in a, and, and that's been entirely pragmatic, right? You wanna solve problems, you create institutions to solve problems, but now that you do that, there's tons of exit options out there. And why continue investing in these very difficult, complicated, global institutions anymore? So I think in, to some extent, uh, multilateralism has been undermining itself in a way by creating a lot of, of alternative venues for states to go to resolve their particular problems. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, thanks very much for your talks. Uh, I have a question for Christoph. Um, 
regarding your uh, description of Utopia, it strikes me that it sounds at least something like uh, the EU experience, at least from the perspective of new members trading openness in their economy for big influx of uh, public money transfers. Um, and so to what extent do you think the EU experience, especially in broadening membership, um, seems for or against the So I haven't thought of, of the EU as an analogy. Um, I guess the, that's in part because the two, I don't see the two as, as being so jointly um, linked. Um, but you're right, in some way, so there you have transfers from, uh, from the, the organization itself to the member states in exchange for um, openness, in a way. So. I guess what I have in mind is precisely linking the um, giving in to demands for protection with uh, this this commitment to, to compensate. Um, but you know what? I'd have to I'd have to think of that. So I think it's a very astute comment. I'd have to think of that uh, um, some more. Uh, I do think there's something to that to that analogy. address this um, more specific question first. So I, I think it, it comes down to uh, what is your point of reference in, in time as it were. So think of the China-US case. Well, the, the fact that the US opens its market to Chinese exports um, is of obvious benefit to, to China. 
and then uh, the fact that domestic politics in the United States uh, push for putting up barriers again is to the detriment of China. And so then the question is, well, what do you, are you comparing to autarky or are you comparing to openness? Um, my point is simply that once you're at that, uh, once you've made those commitments to open, uh, first of all, the commitments may be more credible as a result of you having also committed to adjustment. If we're to believe that uh, a lack of adjustment may lead you to uh, what Robert Putnam called involuntary defection, right? So that uh, you would like to remain open because you agree that there are gains to be had domestically from trade because your consumers uh, benefit. However, you are made to defect uh, because of rising populism and the kinds of uh, phenomena, that, phenomena that we see now. And so precisely to, to, to preempt that and in recognition of those spillover effects, uh, you would you would commit ex ante, um, so I guess that's that's the way I would I uh, I would think of it again in terms of and you know let's recall how this happens. This is all about reciprocal concessions. So you get mar market access in exchange of of providing it, which is a bit of a of a, of a kind of a uh, of an institutional uh, contraction in its own. It's a very mercantilist uh, mechanism at heart. But uh, but yeah, I, I I just go back to this idea that. Had China seen this coming 20 years ago, it would have uh, gotten a lot out of a U.S. commitment to redistribute the gains from trade. And uh, let me think about the broader question uh, while uh, Lisa addresses it. Okay. Sure. Well, yeah, absolutely. We've been complicit. I mean, there's... <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Um, so I think if you look at the international relations scholarship of the last few decades um, on multilateralism, international institutions, and so on, it's it's not that there are no prominent articles on domestic politics, right? I mean, they, they, they've been out there. But I think Bob Cohen is exactly right that that was not the core of our analysis. Um, and it, specifically, the analysis of the domestic distributional consequences of international cooperation was very marginalized. I, there just was not very much of that. And so in a way, I think there, there's a consistency between the way that um, international relations scholars treated these issues and the way that the international institutions themselves treated the issues, right? So if you think about trade institutions, it's not that those individuals bargaining in the institutions and you know, doing the dispute resolution and all of that, it's not that they're unaware that there are domestic distributional consequences of, of trade agreements. But again, that's not their business, right? Their business is to generate global welfare benefits on the international level. And it is the business of state governments to figure out how to deal with the distributional consequences of that. And I think that they were not tied together either in practice or in theory. Um, and then to the extent that, that you know, national governments don't deal with the domestic distributional consequences, they go instead along the lines of austerity, that creates huge problems. And that's why I have to say, I think that what Christoph has presented about sort of tying together the domestic protection mechanisms with the international agreements themselves is really a fascinating and novel idea because that's a way of trying to, to, to make this work, right? And I, I, I actually don't think it's utopian. I think it's a great idea. So. I will say yes, Bob is right. We were complicit. And I'll give you a, a small anecdote of this. I wrote a paper that suggested that some people would benefit from breaking WTO rules and other people would lose from breaking WTO rules within a country. And this, this was not well received. I mean, this was really shocking stuff, right? There was this idea that democracies comply. It's good for democracies to comply. They get these benefits. They're going to comply, you know. And I said, well, sometimes there will be some groups within a country that will actually want them not to comply, that they're going to break the rules and they're going to benefit from breaking the rules. And it really, I really was an uphill struggle to, to get that. And I mean, okay, this was 2010, but I mean, really, there was resistance to this idea that international organizations, both compliance with and non-compliance with, had distributive consequences within countries that it would be good for some people not to comply with an international organization. It was, it was tough. It was an uphill battle. <laughs> Uh, in 2000, Shivian Slaughter wrote an article, a front page article for Foreign Affairs called A New Deal for Globalization. Everything's there. So they see the distributional consequences, they propose some uh, very sensible recommendations, 
which uh, we are now uh, seeing the wisdom of. And so it's not that uh, no one saw it coming, it's just that maybe there wasn't much attention paid to those uh, ideas because those institutions were fighting a very different fight, right? So think back to 2000, battle for Seattle and so on, uh, the pushback was coming far more from developing countries and, and with real uh, issues, right? And so I think there was very little uh, attention being paid to distributional consequences in uh, uh, rich countries. And, but, but again, so I, I teach that article every year and every year I'm amazed rereading it, the extent to which these two guys saw a lot of this coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm gonna jump in and say that uh, I think about this the same way that, you know, the arguments that the, the Queen's question about how did the economists miss, miss the crisis, it's, they didn't actually, there were plenty of people who foresaw things, but those explanations were not dominant in the field. And I think in the same way what Christoph touches about is, there were lots of people, I would look at Jeff Frieden's Global Capitalism book and basically say, it's all there going back to the 19th century in their interwar period about the domestic political foundations of international economic cooperation. Uh, but those were not, those were not the hegemonic views in the field. Uh, but the other thing I would say that, that uh, that came up with, I think, Lisa's talk was, um, I think that we as international relations scholars um, underestimated the potential damage to international economic institutions uh, from expansion, from enlargement. And I think the EU is the big case of this, that the delicate balance between mutual gains and domestic politics in the Bretton Woods period, in the sort of early days of the EU, is with a relatively small number. Right, and the collective action problems were small and you could balance the domestic and the international. Um, and you go from six to 28 and it breaks down. And I think in the WTO you go from, what was it, 44 to 185 and suddenly the, you can't balance the, the domestic and the international in the same way. And I think that's one of the things when you add in global finance and globalization that we're, that we're wrestling with now. So, um, and on that note, unfortunately, we are, we are out of time, but we're going to hear a lot more from Denny. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you, Richard, Christoph Nelk, Lisa Martin.